I'm going to pass things over to Tiffany Wilson, the CEO of the University City Science Center. Thanks, Angela. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone in person uh, and, and hi virtually. Um, so as Angela mentioned, I'm Tiff Wilson. I'm the president and CEO of the University City Science Center. And welcome to MedTech Night. For those of you who know me well, uh, you know I love the medical device sector. Uh, it's very special to me. It's actually probably 20 years ago around this time I was starting uh, my uh, journey in innovation and entrepreneurship in the medical device sector. Um, so I'm thrilled to bring that passion to the Science Center and the community here in Philadelphia, uh, even after, after I've only been here for, for eight and a half months. Um, but, you know, AdvaMed uh, was particularly valuable to me um, early in my med tech career um, and, and really to this day as a consistent place to go for new connections, uh, updates on policy, uh, information, the latest and greatest trends. Um, so it was really an obvious place to kick things off and really hear how the industry is doing, what's new, uh, what's changing coming out of uh, COVID. So. Thanks for join, joining us, uh, Andy. Just to give everyone a little bit about Andy's background, he's the executive director of the AdvaMed Center for Digital Health and AdvaMed's head of sector initiatives. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, AdvaMed is a leading trade association advancing medical technology in the US and around the world. Um, in his new role, Andy is supporting the center's board of directors and member companies and oversees AdvaMed's global policy and advocacy agenda on a wide range of digital health issues, including regulation, reimbursement, cybersecurity, and data stewardship and privacy. And he's been at AdvaMed for over a decade. Uh, he was the first executive director of AdvaMed DX, which is their diagnostics division. He has served as the chief strategy officer and has had a vast legal career with a strong record of solving high stakes challenges at the complex intersections of regulated business, healthcare, science, technology, law, media, and politics, which is one of the reasons why I find this industry so fascinating to sit at the, that intersection. So welcome, Andy, and we look forward to, to hearing your updates and having a chat after. Well, that's great, Tiff. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the welcome. Wanted to say right up front, um, our CEO and President Scott Whitaker sends his regrets. He was originally hoping to attend and be with you today and unfortunately had something unavoidable come up. And I'm very pleased to step in and, and be here this afternoon. Um, I love talking about AdMed. I love talking about all things MedTech, um, but I'd love even more to have a conversation and answer questions. So I'm gonna try to keep my presentation uh, constrained or I will keep it constrained to about 3.30. Um, there's a lot to cover, but I will try to be succinct. And so please be thinking about questions because um, I'd, I'd love to take them. And I know Tiff and I are looking forward to a good conversation after my, after my remarks. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And uh, I think you should see it now. Um, let's see. Let me actually make sure that I'm on... controls are on multiple screens. Here we go. Tiff, are you getting a full screen or are you getting my slides on the side? No, I see a, I see a full screen. Okay, perfect. All right. Yep. Thank you. You're good. All right. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, so as Tiff said, um, I'm currently the executive director of the AdvaMed Center for Digital Health. Uh, I've been leading our digital health work for a number of years, but this is a new position as we look to elevate the center um, uh, among the various um, AdvaMed initiatives. And I'll talk more about the Center for Digital Health, but I did want to start first with an introduction to and an overview of AdvaMed, some of our priorities. Um, so um, Tiff mentioned briefly our description of the association. We are um, one of the leading associations representing med tech companies around the world. Um, we have over 400 members and we have a presence uh, in a number of key global markets. We have offices in China um, and we also have a presence in uh, India, Brazil, Japan and close working relationships around the world. We are um, one of the leading groups within the Global MedTech Alliance, about 30 trade associations from around the world. So 
Um, we have um, a wide reach across the, across the globe, um, and we are working on a number of issues um, uh, that are outside the U.S. as well. I'm happy to talk more about that, and I'll touch on a few of those as we go through this. Um, so, of course, as a trade association, we serve as the common voice for our members across traditional medical technology technologies, diagnostic products, digital health technologies, um, and reflect kind of an increasingly diversified uh, membership. I thought I'd talk briefly about uh, COVID and some of our work there before turning to our priorities more generally. Um, of course, the medical technology industry, like so many others in healthcare, stepped up from the very beginning on COVID. Obviously, diagnostics playing a critical role um, right up front and throughout uh, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, on ventilators and PPE um, and uh, drug delivery um, systems and just kind of everything else in the hospitals around patient care for COVID, our industry uh, was mobilizing and AdvoMed was mobilizing right alongside our members, um, setting up a variety of initiatives around key aspects of COVID and of course tracking the pandemic closely um, to try to stay ahead of where our companies would need support. Um, we undertook a number of initiatives that were about helping our industry deliver um, COVID response and we also dug deep uh, with the administration on COVID policy related matters and were supportive of numerous flexibilities that the administration, particularly on the FDA and CMS fronts provided um, to expedite care um, on many fronts. And we continue to um, work with the agencies on a number of those uh, flexibilities and look ahead to hopefully maintaining and retaining some of those initiatives from a policy standpoint that were critical to helping support COVID care. Um, and of course, one of the issues we've kept a close eye on throughout the pandemic and ongoing is return to care, what the impact was, has been on COVID uh, for delays in surgeries, delays in care, what's the backlog. Um, and I just, I would say just as a general matter, our, I think based on, you know, feedback from our companies that our outlook is uh, for MedTech is more positive than one might have imagined six months or a year ago. Um, and uh, we see this uh, sector continuing to um, do well, and we're anticipating and hopeful that um, a backlog of patients in various areas can be uh, can be worked through uh, relatively expeditiously. Um, obviously, to state what everyone knows, the, the pandemic is starting to um, settle in some ways in the U.S., but we're also continuing to track it around the world as our companies work around the world. Um, we've been engaged with our industry and in trying to uh, support relief efforts, for example, in India, um, which of, of course has been hit so hard uh, more recently. So I'd be happy to take questions um, about any aspects of COVID, but let me turn to our, our priorities um, widely across, across Advent. And of course, this does not reflect all of our work. It just reflects a number of the issues we consider kind of top line um, as we look ahead to this year uh, and a little bit beyond that. So I'm going to speak briefly to each of these issues that I've listed here as priorities. And again, happy to take on more detail and discussion. So the Medical Device User Fee Act, or MEDUFA, is up for reauthorization um, uh, next year. And so um, the five-year reauthorization process um, entails that we uh, and some other industry representatives meet regularly with FDA and hash out uh, kind of a framework for um, uh, user fees and various initiatives and, and uh, activities associated with the user fee program. Um, and we agree with FDA on various performance metrics on the agency and agree on funding levels and uh, fees for the next round. And we are uh, in the middle of those negotiations. Um, there's not a lot to be said publicly about the substance um, of, of what's happening right now, but um, we have enjoyed a long and fruitful constructive relationship with FDA um, as we've gone through multiple rounds of MEDUFA reauthorizations. Uh, we're looking forward to the same uh, this time around. Um, I think probably any number of you are aware that FDA has really um, done a tremendous job of dealing with COVID burdens. They are also um, struggling to maintain um, uh, keep up with their performance metrics as a result, um, but we're working closely with the agency and hopeful that um, they'll be able to work through that in the relatively near term. Um, sorry, back to the priorities list. So MSIT, um, an acronym that me and I'll be familiar with, Medicare Coverage of Innovative Technologies. This was a um, policy development, a rule ultimately issued by CMS in January that we had worked on we had proposed a number of years ago and had worked closely with the agency on developing. It essentially would provide immediate automatic uh, Medicare coverage for technologies designated by FDA as breakthrough 
upon FDA authorization. Um, the Biden administration has taken another look at that rule that was finalized in January, but not yet implemented. And we are currently working with the administration uh, in hopes of, of actually finalizing and, seeing, finalizing and seeing that rule implemented. It may require some additional policy development and I'd be happy to talk more about that. ETO is the acronym for ethylene oxide. Um, and that issue um, is about the uh, potential additional environmental regulations placed on the use of ethylene oxides as a, as a sterilizing agent in um, the medical technology industry. This is a hugely important industry uh, issue rather for us um, affecting a tremendous volume of medical devices. Um, we're seeing um, various initiatives at the state level um, and potential upcoming federal regulation around this. And um, we're advocating very strongly um, that um, regulation here not be inappropriately heavy handed um, because it would put a significant crimp on our industry's ability to deliver uh, safe medical devices to the healthcare industry. So I can certainly talk more about that. On the tax reform front, this really stands for um, our examination of the corporate tax discussions that are ongoing and some, dis some ongoing deliberations um, within our organization on exactly what aspects of tax reform on which to engage. Um, but uh, it is a, certainly a key issue for us as uh, going forward. Um, Medicare funding, we're working on all aspects of Medicare policy, but we're very cognizant of the fact that the hospital insurance trust fund is projected to be insolvent as of 2024. Um, that timeline was accelerated a bit by um, the employment um, downturn during COVID and uh, that resulted in less tax revenue coming from the payroll tax, which is largely what funds Part A of Medicare. Um, the reason that this is on our priority list is because in um, within a very short time frame, Congress and or CMS are gonna have to take some steps um, to um, extend the solvency of that trust fund, either by changing benefits um, and or changing the tax structure that funds um, that fund or some combination of a variety of policy initiatives that potentially could hurt um, the medtech industry and consequently, um, you know, we fear patient access to our technology. So that's something we're watching very closely. On the health, health equity front, um, this is a topic that AdvoMed took up very intentionally and specifically um, last year, um, partly as a result of widespread discussions um, in the country around racial inequities um, and our desire to look much more closely at how those inequities are playing out in healthcare um, and also galvanized by the impact of COVID um, that really just continue to highlight and underscore existing inequities in healthcare um, access and outcomes. And so we have undertaken a deliberate process to examine how our industry um, could contribute to um, making progress in relieving, mitigating um, those inequities. So we're looking at a number of issues, including clinical trial participation, for example. So that continues to be a pretty high priority for our association. On small business relief, um, this is something that in particular is associated with COVID. Uh, we're advocating very strongly for various measures to provide um, relief and economic support for our smaller companies uh, as they wrestled with the uh, impact of COVID on the healthcare system. Um, on China, uh, China is a challenging marketplace. Um, we're dealing with a number of challenging issues there. Um, first and foremost, probably right now is the uh, continued uh, promulgation of volume-based procurement in China that has driven um, uh, pricing down to probably perhaps unsustainable levels. It really is a uh, large threat to our industry um, as we continue to see VBP um, rolled out in China. Um, so that's a challenging issue and we're, we're working very hard on, on trying to uh, persuade uh, Chinese authorities that volume-based procurement overlooks value. Um, and it has the potential long term or even shorter term to actually be detrimental to patients and patient care. Finally, on the supply chain front, um, we're always interested in and working on various aspects of supply chain that might affect our industry. Um, but it became an absolutely critical issue during COVID, of course, as you all know. Um, so we have worked very closely with the uh, former and current administration on continuing to figure out how to best su support um, uh, supply chain continuation uh, to mitigate impact and disruption on the supply chain. And so that is, again, both COVID specific. Now we're even looking at issues like um, computer chip shortages that um, obviously are in the news. Um, so supply chain will continue to be an issue um, of focus for us. And finally, on this slide, just as a matter of Advomed organization, I would point out that not only 
Um, do we work um, on behalf of all of our MedTech members, but we also have several divisions within AdvaMed where we provide uh, additional support and staffing um, and coordinated policy work um, for these uh, different memberships. AdvaMed Excel is the division focused on our small and emerging growth companies. Um, and AdvaMed DX is the division focused on our in vitro diagnostic companies. And then, then as I referenced at the beginning, and I will talk more about in a moment, our Center for Digital Health. Um, of course, focused on um, not just a vertical of companies, but really the horizontal proliferation of digital technologies um, that are increasingly uh, pervasive in med tech and healthcare. I apologize for some background noise. If you can hear it, I'm afraid I can't do much about it, but I'll continue to uh, speak loudly and hopefully overcome that. So if you turn to this next slide here, um, just wanted to show you this briefly. It is a snapshot of part of our current strategic plan. And it's just another look at the way we organize our work and our issues. Um, so you'll see at this top banner is the way we think about our outward facing policy and advocacy work in these three major buckets, technology and regulation um, around the world, right? In every market in which we're active, we're pushing for timely availability of safe and, medical, safe and effective medical technologies. On the payment and healthcare delivery side, um, we're always looking to maximize the benefit of medical technologies by uh, enhancing patient access. In the US, of course, that plays out um, for us much uh, primarily under Medicare coverage, although we look at private insurance issues as well. In other countries, it may take form, uh, uh, take the form of our work on tendering, for example, um, in countries with uh, sort of different payment and healthcare systems. And finally, trade and commerce is the bucket into which we put all of our tax work, our trade work, global supply chain work that I referenced earlier and so forth. Um, and then to make the other, uh, the additional point that as a trade association, we don't just work on policy and advocacy. We also serve our members in various other ways. Uh, and so on the membership front, um, as I noted on the previous slide, we have divided up our membership in some cases into divisions. And we also have some additional sectors where we provide dedicated support to significant segments of our membership. Um, we act, of course, as the spokesperson, the spokes entity for our industry, provide thought leadership, uh, promote the reputation of the industry, defend the reputation of the industry. And finally, on the business front, we have a number of a growing set of initiatives that are really designed to support our, the business that our companies are in, not just from a policy standpoint, but functionally. So for one quick example, uh, we have a research and development forum, for example, on which we've been collaborating with Deloitte for a couple of years now. We've launched a, an R&D benchmarking survey, providing a, a deeper dive into how the med tech industry is prioritizing R&D spend, thinking strategically about R&D um, as part of the med tech, uh, med tech business. So that's just one example, but it, I call it out because again, our trade association is not just about policy and advocacy, but also about supporting the business of our member companies. So I really wanna to turn to uh, the Center for Digital Health. I'm gonna be really quite brief, so it's gonna be very fast as I whip through a few topics, but I really wanted to dive a little bit deeper here given the critical nature of digital health and the kind of the exploding digital health revolution that we see ongoing. So just to make a couple of obvious points, digital health is here now. We've been talking about it for a long time as though it's something that's coming uh, and there's clearly much transformation still ahead, but <clears throat> digital health is very much here now. Um, I love this quote from Rock Health that said the 2020 had been a fast forward button for digital health. Um, of course, we saw a tremendous investment and in uptick in telehealth, telehealth utilization, but we've also seen funding and tele in, uh, in digital health rather just continue to um, climb sharply. Um, and certainly if you look over a number of years at digital health investment, that, that curve is just, is just climbing rapidly. Um, and I put in here an interesting kind of overview from CB Insights of a number of different um, uh, kind of areas of digital health and some of the companies that are, that are players in those, in those spaces, in some cases emerging, emerging spaces. I won't dwell on this slide. It's really just a few key points about the um, uh, continuing evolution of the digital health or health, health tech horizontal um, and making the point that the value proposition is extremely high, um, but by the same token, companies that are intentionally digitalizing their work um, and becoming data competent um, are at risk um, of being overtaken in some fashion. We talk more about that in discussion for sure. Um, so we set up our digital health work um, well, I should say we've been working in aspects of digital health for many years, especially on the FDA side. Um, we launched our AdvaMed digital health sector a number of years ago, converted it to a center. And now, as I, as I mentioned, we're elevating it to kind of division status um, within the organization. Um, 
and we look at all aspects um, of digital health and our membership is um, accordingly increasingly diversified. So for example, we have a number of consumer and data tech companies in, Companies have come into membership, Google and Apple and IBM, Microsoft, and we have a growing small but growing number of pharmaceutical companies as well, largely coming for our digital health work in some cases, even more specifically for some of our work on data stewardship and privacy. Uh, and under the center, um, we provide access um, to all of AdvoMed, um, these members are both members of AdvoMed and the Center for Digital Health. But in the digital health arena, we focus in particular on an array of regulatory issues that affect digital health um, products and deployment. We focus on cybersecurity as well, which of course is a regulatory topic, but we think of it to some extent distinct um, from other regulatory areas. Payment and healthcare delivery policy, we're really focused on that. Um, and then on data stewardship and privacy. And so I thought I'd elaborate with the few minutes that I'll take left um, on a few of those issue areas. But this slide also represents kind of our program as a whole, policy, advocacy, and industry engagement. And where you can see our four issue areas kind of arrayed around this circle. I wanted to pause for a moment and just focus on what this says in the center of this circle, which is access, efficiency, quality, and trust. Um, we think of these as various dimensions of what digital health um, is facilitating and trust as being really in a sense kind of the, the coin of the realm, if you will, in digital health, um, given that without trust, customers, patients, consumers at large um, are not necessarily you know, going to embrace our products and all the value we can provide um, through the use of data in, in healthcare. Um, and then the wrap around our policy areas is education and collaboration, education of stakeholders and policymakers, collaboration with customers and other stakeholders as well. Very quickly then on data stewardship and privacy, we're working on the state level, we're working on the federal level and we're working on the global level. In the global side, we're focused in particular on the EU and some of the developments over the last year um, having to do with um, privacy regulation and GDPR and a really critical um, legal development in the so-called SHREMS 2 case. Happy to talk about all those issues. Um, we're collaborating closely with MedTech Europe, our counterpart in Europe, and working on, on the issues and implications for industry of constraints on data flows between the EU and, and the US. Of course, that's an issue in other regions as well. On the federal side, um, we're following closely agency activity. Congress is gearing up to at least attempt to pass federal privacy legislation. Um, we can all try to handicap the timing on that. It's probably a matter of if not when, um, and but we're following that activity closely. On the state front, we've been very active lobbying in the states as more and more states have taken up or enacted comprehensive privacy laws of their own as they wait for Congress to act. So of course, California was the first out with the California Consumer Privacy Act. Virginia passed a comprehensive law of its own uh, earlier this year number of other states have been moving significant uh, privacy laws, um, and we have been successful in uh, getting a number of states to adopt a consistent set of exemptions um, from those laws that should be really helpful for industry. Happy to elaborate on that in questions. On the payment and healthcare delivery front, um, we put out a report last fall elaborating uh, at some length on the changes we think Medicare can make under its current statutory authorities to better accommodate digital health technologies. Um, happy to follow up and, uh, and, and point you to that report. Um, Tiff, I can make sure you've got it if you want to send it out to folks. But um, that's a comprehensive roadmap, if you will, to how Medicare can um, better adopt and integrate digital health technologies into its current framework of um, coverage, coding coverage and payment. On the regulatory front, um, of course, FDA has been extremely active in digital health, digital health action plan, working on AI and ML regulatory strategies, um, and work again, working on digital health just comprehensively across the board. We're engaged with the agency on every front, comment on all, on all of its draft guidances, draft rules, and so forth. Um, and you know, really want to commend the agency for working very hard to regulate at the pace of innovation. Um, and then finally, on cybersecurity, um, we, of course, again, work with FDA very closely on pre and post market cybersecurity guidance and policy. Um, and then we also, um, as another example of business support that we provide for industry, uh, we have set up a so-called ISAO, an industry standards and analysis organization um, that uh, serves as a forum in which our member companies can come together and share in a privileged, a legally privileged space, information about late breaking threats on the cybersecurity front, help everyone get ahead of those threats, be aware of them earlier, respond to them more effectively. Um, and so our cybersecurity work is not just about policy, but also about 
about uh, supporting cybersecurity professionals within, within our industry. So Tiff, I think I actually brought that in um, under 30 minutes. Um, so I'm, uh, I know that nice, was a really, nice really work. fast, fast walkthrough, um, but maybe I'll stop there and um, we can go into some discussion and questions. Yeah, thanks for the great update. I know um, y'all have been working on this for a long time as the innovators have been innovating. We've got to figure out how to regulate it, how to pay for it, and how to uh, get it into the, the system. So um, thanks for y'all's leadership on that. Um, Angela, do we have any questions kind of starting off? Please feel, oh, okay, here's a question from Leith. Is Admaved, Adma, sorry, Advamed, <laughs> at all active in interoperability standard setting? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've been following interoperability and monitoring uh, various rulemakings in the interoperability space. We are not directly involved in standard setting um, on interoperability. Um, we are not a standard setting organization per se, um, but we do go where our members ask us to go. And so if there were a critical kind of mass of companies asking us to dive deeper into that space or engage with uh, on standard setting in some fashion, um, we would do it. So right now I would say it's more of a, of a interoperability both on standards and on, on rules and regulations has been a little bit more of a monitoring issue for us than it has been a direct engagement. You mentioned that um, AdvoMed has 400 members. What percentage of those are kind of traditional med tech, uh, non-AdvoMed Excel companies, and what percentage of those are more of the startups? And are you guys still classifying um, the, the startup or emerging $100 million in revenue and under? Yeah, we are absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so our AdvoMed Excel membership, again, is the kind of the companies at the $100 million mark or below. But of course, $100 million is a lot different than, than a you know early stage startup. Um, a solid kind of two thirds of our members are in that smaller company category. So although a lot of people who don't know us well kind of look at Advent like, oh, you're the big companies. Well, we obviously represent the big companies, but the ma significant majority of our companies are actually in that small group category. And of those, maybe it's another kind of two thirds of two thirds or something that maybe a majority of companies are really in that in that startup phase. So we have a tremendous number of very early stage companies in our membership and Advent Excel runs a number of, of programs um, designed specifically for startup and early stage companies. And of the third of the, the larger med tech companies, um, the Medtronics, the J&Js, the Strikers of the world, um, what are you, so, so those are traditionally, you know, traditional medical devices. So hips, knees, pacemakers, medical equipment and things like that. But we know uh, that there's a lot of convergence. How are they thinking about innovation in kind of marrying their traditional medical devices with digital health aspects? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I can certainly speak to it broadly. Um, one aspect, of course, uh, maybe somewhat obvious is just the sort of the digitalization and the datification of more traditional products, right? So if you take a, uh, a replacement knee, but you put sensors into it, um, then you can monitor post-surgery recovery and rehab, right? To determine how active the patient is and whether they need to be more active and so forth. And you can monitor that recovery care, but you can also, of course, do it longer term as well. Um, so the, the adoption, the use, the integration of various sensors into traditionally, you know, less smart devices into making or making traditional medical products into smart products um, is a sea change, if you will, really in, in the value that, that traditional med tech companies can provide. Um, and not just the patients, but then the other aspect of, of you know, that's going on in um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, commercial models is value-based care, right? So we think about value-based care from a couple of perspectives. And one is uh, Medicare programs, for example, right? Based on where reimbursement increasingly based around, you know, the value of care provided. But of course, this is playing out in commercial contracts as well, where, for example, one of our member companies enters into a value-based care contract with a hospital and goes at risk. Um, our companies are increasingly able to enter into sophisticated arrangements like that around patient care and outcomes over various periods of, uh, of time uh, during patient care because they can collect more data. Uh, in some cases, because they can collect more data from technologies that are, that are data collecting technologies um, and um, aggregate that data, analyze that data, and bring new insights to bear on the course of care 
at how a patient is doing, for example. Um, and then our, so you've got a company that's really climbing the value chain, right? For, you know, first you kind of that, say fire and forget sounds a little dismissive, but fire and forget your product into the healthcare system, right? You bought it, now you use it. Uh, and climbing the value chain for our companies means now I can actually engage in patient care. I'm going to um, be part of the um, aggregation of data around how this patient is faring um, based on data, data generating capabilities that I can bring to bear. Um, perhaps I'm now engaged in providing more remote care. Maybe I'm supporting that patient through remote monitoring outside the hospital. Um, but now I, as a medical device company, as a medical technology company, taking more responsibility for that patient's care throughout, you know, some, some designated recovery period, for example. Um, and then the data capabilities that it takes to, you know, parse that data um, and assess the value of those outcomes is something that our companies are increasingly owning. So increasingly, because of those capabilities, our companies can go into really into partnership with their customers. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a tremendous change, right? It's, it requires um, understanding some legal parameters that understands structuring, you know, these, these agreements. Um, but it also requires some of the data capabilities and competencies um, to drive those arrangements and, and assess whether or not various metrics have been met. Um, but that's one of the, you know, the major changes that digital technologies are driving um, for industries enabling our, you know, traditional companies to um, go into whole new business models um, and continue to innovate, um, essentially even, you know, innovate against themselves, if you will. Wonderful questions. Yeah, we have some more questions. Um, Katie asks, how can or do academic institutions and programs engage with AdvaMed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our AdvaMed Excel division actually has a program for academic institutions and particular incubators within academic institutions. Um, but we'd love to connect anyone interested in that um, with, our, with our staff um, that manage um, AdvaMed Excel. Um, we've really built out engagement there. Um, and some activities are really focused specifically on academic institutions. So um, Tiff, I leave it to you to, you know, to figure out what the best way is to, you know, connect some folks yep. with us afterward, but um, we'd be really happy to follow up on that. Great. Uh, we have another question from Denise. Who can we write to in the Biden administration to advocate for automatic CMS reimbursement for FDA designated breakthrough devices? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I appreciate the sentiment behind it as well, because we'd really like all your support on this. Um, and I, I can elaborate a little bit on you know, what's going on that issue too. So um, it's the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is the agency that is, has developed that policy, continue to look at that policy and is contemplating how to ultimately implement um, this proposal. Um, there is in the, in the, uh, in the rule, um, the proposed rule that was, or I should say the request for comments that came out in March, there is a specific contact point um, in that proposal for submitting comments. While the official comment period is closed, you certainly could still submit comments um, or they could simply be addressed to um, the new administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashure at CMS. But again, that's something where, um, Tiff, if, uh, if it's helpful, I can follow up and provide a little more specific information there. Great, thank you. Um, so what hurdles do you see? So you mentioned um, during your remarks, uh, the fast forward button and the quote from, and so that was, you know, COVID really accelerated the adoption of a lot of telemedicine and digital health platforms and that it is a thing now officially. Um, well, what hurdles the, do you I, see I don't have the um, from a legislative or... <laughs> I'm saying it, it's official, <laughs> it's official. now, okay, so. Agree. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, it, we made it a thing, we made it a thing. Um, but thinking about uh, remaining hurdles from Congress or from a legislative standpoint um, for the ongoing adoption of telemedicine, um, you know, from a payment model standpoint, um, from the challenges, you know, the, the federal versus the state, uh, differences, if any, um, what, what do we need to be thinking about there? Yeah, that's a great question. So I just tick, I tick off, I guess, a few different um, considerations. And one is um, the extent to which CMS maintains current 
um, to flexibilities around telehealth reimbursement. For example, they did away temporarily with geographic restrictions on telehealth reimbursement. Um, and we've advocated for the continuation of some of those flexibilities so that telehealth continue to be as supported post public health emergency as it is now. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of strong support for that. I know certainly within Congress, I think CMS probably would be hard pressed not to see some way to continue to, you know, support telehealth and in somewhat more like the way that they've done now during COVID. Um, so, but there's that continued aspect, which is, um, you know, Medicare reimbursement um, and, you know, any other related policies around telehealth. Um, of course, there's um, the, um, simply the practical aspect of, you know, what happens in the actual marketplace um, as COVID abates. Um, and we see, you know, maybe we come off some of those peak telehealth adoption rates, you know, kind of where does telehealth settle out longer term? Uh, I'm not going to try to forecast that. Um, but after that initial, you know, sort of COVID push, um, you know, it may, it'll, it'll just remain to be seen um, how sticky telehealth is. Of course, many of us think it is sticky. Um, we think there's tremendous value, um, not just to telehealth in terms of, of you know, video-based encounters and so forth and access to docs, but the broader um, push and ability to undertake remote patient monitoring, for example. So CMS policies certainly around reimbursement for all aspects of remote care and um, will, be, will be important going forward. Um, and I guess not on telehealth specifically, but I guess I just make a comment in general, which I think you could extend to all digital health technologies and products is, um, you know, one of the rate limiters around adoption is physician fatigue, right? Or I should maybe put it a different way. It's just, you know, physician value, right? Physicians, hospitals at large, and then individual physicians and practices get a lot of solutions pushed at them all the time. Digital health is no exception, you know, just this proliferation of, you know, um, of pitches. And so I think, you know, the challenge for folks in our industry um, is to think about how to cut through that, cut through that noise and really be thinking all the time about, you know, how does your product not just solve a clear problem or provide clear value, but how can it be adopted either system-wide or by an individual clinician in a way that takes less time and less attention, right? Because if ultimately you're asking a clinician to spend more time to adopt your solution or product, um, yeah, that's great. No, matter, no matter how good the value is, it, it just may not, it may just not just work. So anyway, the point is obviously there's policy rate, rate limiters here around adoption of various aspects of digital health. And then there's just very pragmatic sort of practice-based um, rate limiters too. Um, I was really happy to see that um, y'all are spending uh, a lot of time thinking about health inequities, um, you know, as a, as a strategic priority. Um, it's, it's a strategic priority for the Science Center uh, as well as we kind of come out of the pandemic and are in our strategic planning process. Where, where are you guys seeing opportunities um, to um, address some of these health inequi inequities with digital health technologies? And then how are you learning from some of your global partners who have maybe different care delivery models? Um, to you know, take care of our vulnerable patients, both in, in urban and rural areas. Yeah, Tiff, I'm glad you came back to this. It's obviously such an important topic. Um, so just briefly, as I referenced before, on our, on our wider health equity initiative, one of the areas that we've looked at most specifically because our industry has the ability to be you know, closely engaged on it is clinical trial enrollment and ensuring that there is a, you know, uh, diversity of participation in clinical trials and so that not just representation of diverse populations, but that the information gleaned uh, from those clinical trials actually reflects, um, you know, that, that um, broader populations. Um, on digital health more specifically, we have looked at um, one area in terms of understanding, trying to understand better um, known inequities in access, and that is in diabetes technology in CGM uh, for example, and ultimately, you know, closed loop systems and so forth. Um, it's been well publicized and there have been some uh, studies, relatively recent, I think, um, showing that adoption of advanced diabetes technologies is significantly lower in certain minority populations. And 
So we're having some discussions with our diabetes companies about, you know, sort of how to dig into that further, understand better underlying root causes. I mean, the broader socioeconomic um, issues are certainly in some ways probably intuitive and somewhat obvious, but um, we really want to understand better sort of are there differences in prescribing patterns, for example, among general practitioners versus endocrinologists and, you know, really get into, you know, some of what's going on there and determine whether or not we can do anything meaningful um, to try to address or mitigate some of those disparities in either access or disparities in ultimate adoption. Um, you know, I have to kind of figure out which of those it is. Uh, maybe it's some of both. So that's an area in digital health and diabetes specifically that we're, we're looking at and asking ourselves if we can you know, do something meaningful about it or work with the administration to address that issue there in, in a narrow sense. I would also say more broadly, um, we're really bullish on a proposition that I think has yet to be you know, fully, um, well, has yet to be you know, tested, which is conceptually, um, we love the fact that digital health technologies are en enabling the delivery of more and more care at the point of person outside the intensive resource, you know, resource intensive setting of hospitals, for example, pushing care all the way back to the home or other settings where the individuals are, you know, normally, rather than the individual going somewhere to get care, um, whether it's remote, remote patient monitoring, actual remote therapeutic interventions, digital therapeutics offer that ability, right, to bring care to someone's phone. Um, and so, the democratization of healthcare through digital health um, is something that is really exciting. And on this sort of by the same premise, um, at least conceptually, one can imagine that one we could also address healthcare access inequities in healthcare access um, and, and in quality of care by bringing these technologies to um, populations that have historically and continue to have less access and, and poor outcomes. And again, that's a broad proposition. It's easy to say it in a sort of excited way, um, how that actually plays out and how you actually deploy digital health technologies in a very focused way to achieve those um, benefits. I think, you know, yeah, remains to be really tested. That's, that's great. Um, so I think we're just about out of time. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, Venture Cafe serves a a wide range of innovators and entrepreneurs uh, addressing a lot of challenges in healthcare. For those uh, entrepreneurs out there, those startups who are working on promising connected devices, addressing some of these issues as well, what advice do you have um, kind of from the AdvoMed lens should they be thinking about moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I So I start with a kind of a broad admonition, if you will, or, a, or, a, or a, a core piece of advice that I hope everyone's already heard and, and is hearing it over and over, which is um, to really plan ahead, right? I mean, we're, we're pretty cognizant of the fact that startup companies with limited resources and limited staff often have to focus on what's right ahead, right? It's get to that next metric, it's get to that next milestone or benchmark, get your next, you know, round of funding, um, and that kind of pressure and milestone-based um, uh, planning can really, in, I think sometimes inhibit um, just the ability or even the mindset of looking out, you know, some years down the road at what evidence you're going to need to have in hand to secure Medicare coverage, for example, or private insurance coverage, thinking very granularly about coding issues and coverage policy and payment mechanisms, right? It's really easy when those aren't the things right in front of you to not think about them and think that they can be addressed later. But the problem with that is that you get to those gatekeeping stages when being ready for those challenges is really critical. And you find out that you should have been thinking about them several years before and have incorporated planning for those things into R&D even, right? And really thinking about product design and you know what sort of populations you're shooting for and what the value proposition really is of your technology when you have ultimately have to sit in front of a CFO of a hospital system or you know some other person who's either purchasing or influencing the purchase of your product, right? So I recognize it's a challenge, but I really encourage everyone to be thinking about like, what's that long-term picture? What's that whole picture look like? What am I gonna need in hand when I get to that point? And what are the investments I really need to be thinking about making now so that I'm ready for the for those for those kind of you know next thresholds? And we've seen companies, you know, experience both things. One is plan for those things early on, 
talk to a lot of people, get a lot of input, input, right? Get really smart on the path that other companies have followed to be successful. Um, and the companies that do that often are successful because they really understand that there's a, there's a long road ahead and what's going to what they need in hand now. Um, and of course, we've seen companies the opposite, right? Which is you become enamored of your technology, which may be fantastic, but you haven't necessarily thought through um, ultimately what's the value proposition that I have to explain to a hospital customer? What's the value proposition as I have to explain it to a patient? The value proposition is I have to explain it to an adopting clinician, for example, right? There's a lot of audiences for a product. Um, there may be only one payer somewhere along the line, but there may be five or six different discrete audiences and it's a somewhat different value proposition for each of them. Um, it's never too early to start thinking about how to tell that value story for those different audiences. And if you can't come up with a compelling story for each of those key audiences now, you probably need to rethink you know, what, what, your, uh, what your commercial strategy is going forward. And Tiff, obviously we can talk a lot more about that, but um, we're really you know, excited to help companies think through all those issues and actually work on those issues with our companies. Um, and some of you may be familiar that we put together a few years ago, a value of med tech framework. And it is a roadmap to asking key questions about your product and how to think about making that value case to a variety of audiences. Is it still uh, on your website? You know, we, we literally just soft launched our new website today. I'm not actually quite sure what's still there, Tiff, but um, as with some other points of information, we'd be happy to follow up and-, and Yeah, it's, that, it know. is a great, it's a great read. Um, well, Andy, thank you so much for kicking us off on our med tech journey today. And it's great to reconnect and um, look forward to continued collaborations between the Science Center and AdvaMed uh, as we move forward. Tiff, that's great, thank you. Congratulations on your role. That's not, not so new anymore. Um, and we would love to continue collaborating with you and all of your constituents. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Tiff.